Let's go to our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Some of these are familiar verses of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. It says that He, Jesus Himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, the Bible says here that Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. He has placed these people in the body of Christ for what purpose? To equip people, it says to equip, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. So who is supposed to do the work of ministry? Let me hear you. Saint Joseph, Saint... Who? The saints, believers. Believers are supposed to be doing... The work of ministry. He has put these fivefold ministry gifts in the body so that they can equip saints for the work of ministry. Ministry is to be done by the saints, meaning all of us, believers. We are the ones who are supposed to be doing ministry. So look at your neighbor and tell them real strong, you are a minister. And then look at them once again and say, you have a ministry. You know, every person sitting here has a ministry. Every person, every believer here is called by God to be a minister of God. And you come to the house of God to be equipped by these fivefold ministry gifts that Christ has placed in the church. They equip you, they give you the equipment you need, the strength you need, the understanding, the skill, the impartation, the instruction you need. But ministry is supposed to be done by the saints. Ministry is not relegated or ex kept exclusively just for the pastors and teachers and etc. Amen. Each one of you sitting here has a ministry. And look at verse 7. It says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To each person, the Bible says, grace has already been given. God has already released grace to you. He has already released a measure of Christ's gift to you. Every believer sitting in this auditorium has been given grace and has been given gifts. Or gifts. Amen. Why do you think He gave that to us? We just look at a couple of verses here in Romans 12. All of these are familiar verses of Scripture. Romans 12. Verse 6 through 8. It says, Having then gifts... Deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let's all say together, let us use them. Having then gifts, deferring according to the grace given to us. All of us have got different gifts, depending on the grace of God that's been extended to us. Different gifts. The Bible says, having then gifts, deferring according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Not talk about them, not pray about them, not think about them, not keep them, but use them. Amen. So God wants all of us to be using our gifts and exercising the grace that has been extended to us. And he kind of lists, lists some of them here. If prophecy, let's prophesy in proportion to our faith. If it's ministering or service, let's use it to minister or serve. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There are seven gifts or areas of grace listed here. And these are not complete. It's not a complete listing. There are many, many more grace or areas of grace and gifting that God has extended to His people. But the main point is this. Whatever gifting or grace you've been given, God's Word says, let's use them. Amen. The same thing is there in 1 Peter chapter 4, over in the other part of the New Testament, 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
1 Peter 4.10. As you have received the gift, minister it. Use it to serve one another. Use your gifts to serve one another. Not to serve yourself. So the gifts and grace of God are not given for me to serve myself with. It's given to me to serve others with. Amen? And then it continues in verse 10. Be a good steward of the manifold grace of God, of the multifaceted, of the amazing grace of God. Be a good steward of it. Be a good manager of it. Be a person who's, who's doing well with what God has given to him or her. So I want to ask you this morning, are you a good steward of what God has given to you? Of the gifts and the grace that God has blessed you with? Are you a good steward of it? Are you using it to minister to one another? Are you using it? Are you being a good steward of it? Continuing on verse 11, it says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers or serves, let him do as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and dominion forever and ever. So it says, whatever you do, whether you're speaking or whether you're serving, do it according to the ability that God has given you. Amen. So this takes off the, respon- the, the, the spirit of competitiveness amongst us. Amen. Because we're not here to outdo each other. We're here just to do according to the ability God has given us. That's all. He says, use it according to the ability God has given you. If you've got, you know, a certain amount of ability entrusted to you by God, use it. Somebody else has got more, let them use it. Somebody else has got much more, let them use it. Use it according to the ability God's given you. So you don't have to feel bad that somebody else has got greater ability than you, or you don't have to feel proud that you've got greater ability than somebody else. Each one of us are encouraged by God to serve according to the ability given to us by God. There is no competition here. There's no issue of who's better, who's bigger, who's smarter, who's stronger, who's more spiritual. None of that matters. Each one is doing according to the ability God has given them. We just, be good, we just have to be good stewards of it. And it continues, verse 11, do it to glorify God. Minister according to the ability given to you by God, so that God may be glorified in all things. We're not doing this to glorify ourselves. We're doing this to glorify God. So use your gifts to make God look good. Amen. Use it to glorify God. Now I want to take you to one particular gift, which kind of is neglected. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. We look at verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed. Let's say this together. God has appointed. So this wasn't decided by the pastor. God has appointed what? These in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings. What's the next one? Let me hear you. Loud and clear. Come on, loud and clear. Helps. Who appointed them? God. You know, some people think helps. Pastor couldn't do it himself, so he told people to help him. No, sir. The Bible says God has appointed a ministry in the church, and it's called the ministry of helps. And what is help? It's just doing anything and everything. It's just doing something to help somebody else. And this function, this ministry in the church is appointed by God. Not the pastor, not some people just decided about it. No, the ministry of helps was appointed by God. Just getting in there and doing something to help get the job done. The ministry of helps was appointed, put in the church by God. So if somebody says, you know, I can't sing, I can't preach, And I don't think I have all those talents. There's at least one thing you can start doing. And that is helping. 
Amen? Just do whatever needs to be done. There are so many things that need to be done in the church, and I'm talking about the local church context. There are so many things that need to be done in the church, whether it's in Sunday service, during the course of the week, which doesn't require any special skill. I mean, you don't have to graduate from law school to be a parking lot attendant. You don't need some great, you know, degree to be a greeter or to be involved in hospitality or to do all this setup. Yes, to be part of the worship team, you need certain skills. You need that good voice and some other talents. But there are lots of other things that need to be done in the house of God that does not require special ability. All it requires is somebody who's willing to help. Amen. Amen. And helping, the ministry of helps, is a God-appointed function in the body of Christ. It's not something to be looked down upon. God has said it in the church. Amen. Amen. Now, while all of us must discover our gift and function, because God indeed has given special grace and gifting for all of us, and we must discover it, it's very likely that, you know, many of us, or the majority of us sitting here this morning may say, you know, I don't know what my grace, and I don't know what my gifting is, really. Well, then here's a simple word of encouragement to you. Start in the ministry of helps. Just start there. You say, well, what will happen to me? Several things will happen to you when you just start helping. First of all, you will develop a servant's heart. That's a prerequisite for any other ministry in the body of Christ. The heart of a servant. Amen? And the only way you can develop the heart of a servant is by being a servant. You don't get it by reading books. You, get, you develop the heart of a servant by being a servant. By just getting up there and saying, I'll do anything you tell me to do. I just want to serve. Other things that will happen. Character will be built. You will develop obedience. You know, we need obedient people. You will develop commitment. The ability to carry responsibility. You will develop several traits, character traits, several facets to your character just by being a good helper in the house of God. Things that you cannot get by reading books or, you know, doing other things. You just need to serve and you'll develop these things in your life. And as you start serving, just being a helper, what will happen? You will, you will eventually come to a place where you will discover God's unique gifting and grace on your life. You know, take examples in the Bible. Think about Stephen and Philip in Acts chapter 6. In Acts the 6 chapter, verses 1 to 8, the apostles, you know, the church was growing. The apostles had a lot of work to do. And so they said, you know, let's just find seven good men. Men of good report. Men of good character. Men who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And let them put, let's put them in charge of this responsibility of serving food to the widows. So they chose a man named Stephen. They chose a man named Philip. And what was their responsibility? They had to serve food. To the widows. Just being helpers in the house of God. That's all. And I don't know what all they had to go through to serve food. Maybe they got scolded at. Not enough salt today. Who cooked this? You know? I don't know what they went through. Maybe they had to clean up after the widows ate. Maybe they also had to wash all the dishes. That's where Stephen began. That's where Philip, the event, Philip began. What do we read about Stephen in verse 8? It says, And Stephen, a man full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So God used Stephen in the miracle ministry, bringing miracles and healings. But what was his role in the church? He was a helper. Amen. And think about Philip. He was a helper, just serving food. Maybe he was serving tea or biscuits. Or momos. I don't know what else snack you have out there. But he was just serving these kinds of food for the people to, you know, have something to eat. What happened to Philip? He served faithfully in the church. And probably he served for, for a period of 12 years. Because, you know, the, the church in Jerusalem just stayed in Jerusalem the first 12 years. They didn't move out. 
But then persecution came. And after 12 years, though they had the great commission from Jesus, they just stayed in Jerusalem. After 12 years, persecution came. People were forced out of Jerusalem. Philip was forced out of Jerusalem and he went to Samaria. And what happened? He became Benny Hinn. Not literally. But he had a big crusade. And the whole city came together to hear this man preach. And the Bible says there was great healings and miracles and devils were cast out. And there was great joy in that city. And Philip was used by God to raise up, a, to break new ground, to pioneer a new church in Samaria. Which none of the apostles were did. They were still in Jerusalem. And then Philip was the first one to have supernatural flights. Paid for tickets. Transported by the Holy Spirit. Supernaturally. Just travel over. Taken from one place to another. First man. Philip was used by God to give the gospel to an Ethiopian man on his way back from Jerusalem in a chariot. And this man went back to Ethiopia and brought the gospel into Africa. Amen. But how did Philip begin his wonderful ministry? He started by serving food in the house of God. That's all he did. Serving food. He was a servant in the house of God. And at the right time, he was launched into a ministry as an evangelist. And later on, you read about Philip. He probably got married, had daughters, and his daughters were prophets, prophetesses, women prophets in, in their place and time. Amen. But this man began by serving food in the house of God. So once again, the point here is this, that when you just begin to do something, help. It will set you on course. At least you will start sailing. Start moving towards your God-given destiny. Amen. Think about Barnabas. The first time you read about Barnabas in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, the thing you read about Barnabas is that, you know, his name was actually Joseph. Uh, the apostle said, we'll call him Barnabas because we see him as a good encourager. So probably his in the early ministry was just encourage people, just cheer them up. So they gave him a name. He's an encourager, Barnabas. And the first thing he did was this. He, he had a land, piece of land. He went and sold it. He brought the money and gave to the house of God. So he was a giver. So two things we know about Barnabas in the church. He was an encourager and he was a giver. That was his ministry. Nothing very prominent, nothing very big. And you don't hear about much about Barnabas until Acts chapter 9 and then verse 27. The other thing Barnabas did is he goes and brings Paul and introduces Paul to the apostles. That's all the next thing you hear about Barnabas. He brings Paul, so introduces, him, introduces Paul to the apostles. So that's probably another you know, 10, 12 years. So what Barnabas is doing all this while? Faithfully serving as an unknown entity or as an unknown person in the church in Jerusalem. Faithfully serving. Just being an encourager, being a giver. There's no description of what all he did. Just behind the scenes guy, serving. But then what happened? When the church was established in Antioch, Acts 11, the apostles handpicked this man named Barnabas and they say, Barnabas, we want you to go to this newly raised, planted church in Antioch and we want you to take care of it. And they send Barnabas out to go and take care of this church. And Barnabas becomes the first pastor, the first leader of the Antioch church where the Bible says the, people were, the believers were first called Christians. What an honor. He was a nobody in the church of Jerusalem. No mention of what happened to you. What he was doing, a behind the scenes guy. He's now in charge of the church of Antioch. And the Antioch church becomes a church much better than the church in Jerusalem. It becomes a prototype church because in the church in Antioch are raised up prophets, teachers, and apostles. Barnabas goes and brings Saul to the church in Antioch and they teach the word for two years. And then you read in Acts 13, chapter verses 1, 2, and 3 that the Holy Spirit says, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have for them. So the Holy Spirit himself handpicks Barnabas and Saul, brings him out of the church in Antioch, and sets him on course on another international ministry now. And what happens? When Barnabas and Saul go on this missionary journey, Acts the 14th, chapter the 14th verse you read, it says, the apostles, Barnabas 
and Saul. So now Barnabas has stepped in to an apostolic ministry. Where did he begin? He began being a nobody in the church in Jerusalem. Just being an encourager. Just being a giver. He continued there for many years. We know it took a long time before Saul actually got saved. So he continued for a period of 12, 15 years just being behind the scenes guy. Then he was launched into the next phase of his ministry when he was sent to take care of the church in Antioch. From there, after two years, he was launched into his apostolic ministry. Amen? So what I'm saying is this. If you will just start helping in the house of God, just doing the little bitty, nitty, just little, little things in the house of God and being faithful to it, God will see your faithfulness and He will take you on from there. Pull you on to, from face to face, level to level, and release you into the call that He has on your life. But it's going to begin when you answer the call to be a helper in the house of God. Amen? You know, there are several areas that you can serve in the church, and I'll just kind of run through some of them. You know, we need parking lot attendants, greeters, people involved in hospitality, visitors welcome, people to work the information desk, hospitality, ushers, stage setup, audiovisual team, and if you're gifted in other areas like, you know, praise and worship and so on. And a lot of things that happen out, outside the Sunday service. Uh, visitors follow up, member care, publications. A lot of things that happen in the church office and you can just volunteer your time there. The audio and video editing. Graphics, if you're good in graphics and you, you know how to put things together. You can help in the graphics design and etc, etc, etc. So many other things that can be done. If you are willing to give, contribute a little bit of your time, a little bit of your energy to serve in the house of God. Amen? Now, here's the way the church is organized. You know, we have a pastoral team, a team of pastors um, and church staff. So most of our pastoral team are full-time uh, paid staff of the church because we need them full-time. And God's called them to be that way. So they are paid staff of the church. And uh, they carry a lot of responsibility uh, for the church. A couple of our pastors are volunteer pastors. They're not paid by the church. And then we have ministry leaders. Again, ministry leaders, again, volunteers. But they head up various aspects of ministry. Uh, for example, the equipping workplace, the marriage enrichment. Again, they're, they're headed up. These ministry, t ministry areas are headed up by specific ministry leaders. And then we have volunteer teams, teams of volunteers. The ushers, none of them are paid staff of the church. They're a volunteer team. And Corinne heads up the ushers here at all people in the central church. The greeters, the information, the people who are at the information desk, the people who are at the book table. All of these people are volunteer teams made of people who just willingly give their time. And we have... Every one of the team has a team leader, somebody responsible for that area of service. Somebody who reports back to the church, who sets the guidelines for that area of ministry, who provides instruction and training as required for those people who are volunteering under his leadership or her leadership. It's very simple. So what I want to invite all of us to do is to plug in to one or more areas of, of serving God in the church or outside the church. Get involved. I want to touch upon some attitudes now to maintain while you serve. Some attitudes, nothing much, some quick things here. What attitude should you maintain as you serve in the house of God? I want to talk about four things. The first one is this, serve with a servant's heart. Serve with a servant's heart. You know, Jesus said in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses uh, 26 and 27, He said, whoever will be the leader among you, let him be your servant. Whoever wants to be the chief, let him be the least. So in the, kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, this is how it works. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be a servant. You've got to be able to wash people's feet if you want to show them the way. Amen? So in the house of God, when we serve, we must serve with a servant's heart. You know, what characterizes a servant's heart? You know, first thing is, you know, serve willingly, not grudgingly or out of compulsion. Willingly. 
And I'm really willing to do this. Nobody's forcing me to do it. Nobody's compelling me to do it. Serve willingly. Serve anywhere where there's a need. You know, it's really good to have people who say, hey, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. It gets a little difficult when somebody comes and says, I'm called and anointed by God to be a bus driver and the only thing I'll do is to drive bus. I'm ready to serve, but as a bus driver. It gets a little difficult because we don't need bus drivers now. Amen. So what must you do? I mean, you may be called, gifted, anointed by God to be a bus driver. But since we don't need bus drivers, you know what you should do? You should just come and say, hey, I'm just ready to do anything. I'm called, gifted, anointed by God to be a bus driver. But until the buses come or until you need a bus driver, I'm willing to clean the floor. I'm willing to put the chairs. I'm willing to do the setup. I'm just willing to do anything. We need those kind of people. Such kind of people. Amen. People who are willing to do anything. There are areas that don't need great talent. They just need a willingness to serve. You know, there are lots of people who are volunteers here. If you ask them, you know, what is your gifting? What is your calling? And they can just kind of rattle off 10, 15 different things. You know, I'm gifted to do all these things. But what you see them do in the house of God is they might be pulling these wires there. That's what they're doing. They're not necessarily doing what they're gifted to do. But they're doing something that they're willing to do. It's a big difference. Amen. It doesn't take a whole lot of gifting and anointing to draw these wires. I mean, but it just takes a willing heart. And maybe a little bit of muscle, that's all. You know. A little bit of strength, that's all. Just do it. A willing heart. So, while some of us may be able to use our gifts and callings and find the right place and function, many of us may just have to do anything in the house of God. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Begin there. And in due time, God will move you into a place where you, he will, the set place, that means where you function with your specific gifting, grace, and anointing. But start with doing anything in the house of God. Just, I'll just do anything. Now, I remember when I was in Chicago, and I'm just sharing a few personal things here, not to boast, but just to just let you know that what, what, what happened in my own life. And we were in Chicago, 90, I think, in 1998 to 2000 for about a period of three years, and uh, when we moved to Chicago, you know, I had a few things going outside of church in, my, in the ministry. Time to time, I would travel to places and preach. I had a few invitations to work uh, among the youth and so on. Uh, we were supporting, I think, between 18 to 21 pastors here in India, sending them money and supporting them. Uh, I used to write messages uh, every so often, maybe, you know, once a month, once in two months. Uh, the messages were distributed, sent out. So I had my own ministry going on outside of the church. But we had made, uh, committed ourselves to a small church nearby where we were living for certain reasons. We just said we'll be a part of that church, help that church. Now, when I went to that church, I didn't go there as a big shot. You know, I've got all this ministry going on outside. I've traveled to these places. I've had preaching crusades and done this and done that. No. When I went there, I said, God, I'm willing to do anything to serve in this church. There's a small community, small handful of believers. So I took it on myself. And I, I just kind of used to help anything. And then I took it on myself to, um, to help clean up the basketball. There was an indoor basketball court where the children used to meet during service. So I took it on myself to help mop that place after service. And I took it on myself to help with the putting away of the chairs after service. Now if you ask me, did you, know, did you feel called, anointed to do that? No, I'm just doing it to help. Amen. But I had my own ministry outside. I could have told the pastor, the only thing I'll do in your church is teach the word. I didn't do that. I'm just ready to do anything because I love God. I love His house. I love His people. To me, it doesn't matter whether I mop the floor or whether I preach to thousands. I'm serving the same God. Just doing something different. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter if I'm stacking chairs or if I'm laying hands on the sick. It's the same thing. I'm serving God. So, Amen? So that's what I mean by a willingness to do anything. You know, when we started All People's Church about six years ago, 2001, 
We had a very, very few people. I thank God for all the volunteers who are serving here today. But you know, in those days when we had just about, you know, maybe 20 people, and some of you are here today who were there when we first started, faithful people. And you know, you know we didn't have many people. And, you know, I, I was everything. Georgie and Amy, Benoy, who else I was going to say? You know, they were the worship team. And uh, I was like, I would load the stuff in my dad's car, drive it over to uh, Patel's Inn. These people would show up and we would kind of do everything, set up the speakers, link, you know, connect the wires, do the service, pack everything up, load it back in the car, take it back home. And we, you know, all of us had this, this handful of people had to do everything. That was it. Like none of us could say, I'm specialized. You specialize to do everything. From setup to leading worship to preaching, whatever, whatever, whatever. You just do everything. But then in due time, as more people came, okay, uh, the response grew. We gave, you know, began to uh, allocate specialized areas. But the point is this. There will be times when we just need you to do anything in the house of God. Whether you're gifted to do it or not, just do it. It doesn't take much effort to do it. Another thing about a serving uh, with a servant's heart is this, you must serve passionately. Romans 12 and verse 11. Romans 12 verse 11 says, Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. It says, don't lag in diligence. Being diligent, you know, the worst thing that could happen is when somebody is given a certain responsibility and they just don't show up. You're wondering, is that person, is Akash going to show up today or not? And we'd be in big trouble if Akash was that kind of a guy. Thank God for Akash. Amen. He's stable and solid. You can count on him. Uh, he's there. He's there. I mean, yes, we understand emergencies. We understand when he has to travel on work. But apart from that, he's there. And the people with him, they're there. But imagine what would have happened to us if, you know, hey, will the sound guy show up today? Or not? It would be really difficult to, to function with, with people whom, whom you know, we, we don't know. But, they, but, they, but if they lag in diligence. And then it says, fervent in spirit, meaning red hot, passionate about it. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So when you serve God, you've got to be fervent, red hot. Amen? On fire, serving God. Secondly, when your second attitude to maintain is this: serve without desire for reward from man. You now, when you volunteer, when you serve, don't look for a reward from man. Is Pastor going to mention my name? When, he, when is he going to publicly thank me? When is he going to send me an email? When is he going to call me and thank me for all the hard work that I'm doing? If you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it because you want a reward from man. But really, when we serve God, we must serve God without any desire for reward from man. Look at Colossians 3. Verse 17. And whatever you do, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God through Him. Whatever you do, do it in Jesus' name. Whatever you do, do it in. What does it mean to do things in Jesus' name? It means to do it as His representative. Power of attorney. In Jesus' name simply means power of attorney. So whatever you do, do it in Jesus' name. Do it as His representative. I'm representing Jesus when I'm doing this. I better do a good job because I want Jesus to look good. So whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. And when you do it, give some thanks to God. Giving thanks, not giving grumbling. Giving complaining. No, giving thanks. God, thank you that I can do this in the name of the Lord. And then look at verses 20 and 21. Or rather 23, 24. And whatever you do, he's talking about servants, but I think it applies here. Whatever you do, verse 23, do it heartily, meaning with your whole heart, as to the Lord and not to men. 
knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What are we to do it wholeheartedly as to God, not to man? You know, his pastor watching me. Maybe, you know, he'll come and pat me, whatever. Don't do it to please man. Do it as to the Lord, knowing that you receive your reward from God. See, God will not be any man's debtor. When he sees you serving him faithfully, he is sure to reward you. So do it as to the Lord, saying, Lord, my reward comes from you. I'm not doing this to please any man. I'm not doing this to please anybody. I'm doing this because I love you, God. I'm doing it in the name of Jesus. And I give you thanks that I can do this. Do not look for any reward from man. You know, there are many people here. Now, we, I'm, not, you know, I'm not putting down our full-time pastor. We need full-time pastors. People are paid, salaried ministers of God. We need to bless them. But there are many, many volunteers here who serve in the worship team, who serve in the, in the setting up and serve doing lots of things. They are not paid even one paisa from the church. And they give hours and hours of their time every week. Amen? Let's give them a big hand. God bless you guys and girls. Amen. No, they just serve. They give their time. They give their talents. They give their abilities. They give their heart. They serve willingly and they are not paid by the church. And the many of them here, South Church, North Church, everywhere, they just serve willingly. Not paid by the church. But they give so much. Amen. And I want to challenge you with, with my own life. And all these years, started serving God at the age of 13. And all these years, and six years since we started All People Church, I have not been a salaried person on the ministry. I do not receive a salary from the ministry. I do not receive an honorari honorarium from All People's Church for preaching. Now we give offerings to guest ministers. But I'm not on salary stuff. I do not receive a salary from the church. Never taken all these six years or six and a half years. Amen. If I can do it, I know you can do it. You can also serve God willingly, sacrificially, giving your time and effort for the house of God. Number three, when you serve, serve with commitment. I kind of touched on it. You got to be faithful in what, you what you're given to do. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says, Timothy, I want you to commit the things you've learned from me. Commit it to faithful men. Faithful people. God is looking for faithful people. And Jesus rewards faithfulness. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12. Paul says, Jesus found me faithful and put me into the ministry. Why did he put him into ministry? Because he found him faithful. Dependable. Trustworthy. He will be at his post. He, he will be doing what he's given to you. He's faithful. So I put him in the ministry. If you're faithful in little things, Jesus said he will set you ruler over many things. If you're faithful in what is in other man's, he will give you your own. A faithful man will abound with blessings. The Bible teaches us all these things. So when you serve, you've got to be faithful. Sun or rain, be there. In season, out of season, be there. Things are going good, things are going rough, be there. Amen? That's faithfulness. Last and the fourth thing, you've got to serve with excellence. You know, whatever you do, do it well for God. I mean, it's, it's really disturbing when you see people, you know, they're just doing a sloppy work. Why? Because, hey, after all, I'm doing it for free. I'm not getting paid to do this. After all, you know, I'm just volunteering. And they do a sloppy work. And, and you kind of just, you know, you, you're gracious. You put up with it for a while. And then you start looking. You start praying about it. Saying, God... Please send me somebody who will do the same thing, but they'll do it with excellence. I mean, they give their best to doing it for the house of God. Amen. So four simple things when you serve God. Serve with a servant's heart. Serve with no, without any desire for reward from man. Serve with commitment. Serve with excellence. I want to close with this story from the book of Judges. Chapter 4 and 5. Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5. You know, at this point in time, Judges chapter 4, 
King Jabin of, uh, of Canaan had uh, overpowered Israel and he was kind of oppressing the people of Israel. And for 10 years, they were oppressed by the Canaanites. And during this time, verse 4 of chapter 4, God raises up Deborah, a prophetess. And she begins, to, she begins to speak the word of the Lord and people come to her to get counsel and direction and so on and so forth. So Deborah the prophetess is kind of being a judge over Israel, guiding them and leading them. Even though they are now being oppressed by King Jabin of, of Canaan and, and he has a commander in chief whose name is Sisera. And then the word of the Lord comes to Deborah and she speaks to a man named Barak and says, Barak, I want you to take 10,000 people and go and fight against King Jabin and Sisera and overthrow them. So the word of the Lord comes to a man. Now there are no men like this, but here's what Barak did. He said, I'll go if you come. So he said, you know, Deborah, I just need you by my side. So Deborah goes with Barak. And they go fight against uh, the Canaanite king and Sisera. And eventually a woman, Jael, ends up killing Sisera. And Israel has a great day. That, that day they overthrew the king of Canaan. And Deborah sings a song. On that day, chapter 5, verse 1. And here's what she says in verse 2. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. So she's so happy. About what? When leaders rise up and lead. And when people offer themselves willingly. Because 10,000 people offer themselves willingly to go into battle against the enemy. So see, so excited when people offer themselves willingly, let's bless God. She celebrates that. And then in verse 9, once again, she says, My heart is with the rulers or the leaders of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. So she's saying, man, I'm just so happy about the leaders who rose up to lead and the people who just gave themselves willingly to see this great victory wrought this day in Israel. She celebrates it. But there's a little sad part to this whole story. Verses 15 through 18. Verse 15. Now Deborah is continuing her song and here's what she says. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar so was Barak. Sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. In her account of this whole battle, here's what she says. She says, Issachar, she's mentioning different tribes. Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, they joined with Deborah. Now Issachar were a people who were very strategic. They were wise. They were filled with understanding. They were intelligent people, blessed by God with wisdom. And so they contributed to their wisdom, understanding, and strategy. So Issachar joined along with Deborah. And of the remaining 11 tribes, only two tribes actually came to battle. Zebulun and Naphtali. Verse 18. She says, Zebulun and Naphtali, you jeopardize your lives on the heights of the battle. These two tribes were the only two tribes who actually went into battle that day. When they heard the call of God coming through this prophetess. Come to battle. And only Zebulun and Naphtali came out. But look at the other tribes. There was Reuben. It says in the latter part of verse 15 and early part of verse 16. It says, among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of hearts. But then she asks the question in verse 16. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings of the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. So among the tribe of Reuben, you know what they were doing? They were searching their hearts. They were making great resolves. 
They were having all this discussion. Oh, how should we go to battle? Should we go to battle? Can we win? They had all these great searchings of heart and great results. Yes, we must go into battle. Today is the day. God is with us. The God who delivered us from Egypt. He will deliver us from the hand of the king of Canaan. They had great searchings and great results. But you know at the end of the day. They stayed with their sheep. They didn't go to battle. They stayed with their sheep. Gilead. Verse 17. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. Gilead along with the other tribes of Gad and Manasseh. They lived on the other side of Jordan where they had their own wonderful piece of land. They heard the same call. Come, let's go to battle against the enemy. But it says Gilead decided to stay. They had their own profit making thing by the river Jordan. And they chose to be, take care of their own profit instead of going out to battle. That's Gilead, Dan and Manasseh. So Gilead, Gad and Manasseh. What happened to Dan? Verse 17, Deborah asks, And why did Dan remain on ships? Now Dan, the tribe of Dan, was a tribe that was involved in navigation and shipping business, merchandise. When they heard the call of God, they just remained in their ships. And so Deborah is asking, why did they remain in their ships? We don't know the reason. But we can just imagine. Maybe they were just wanting to continue their shipping business. Man, we're fine. It's okay. We're making money. It's all right. Or maybe they said, you know, we'll stay in our ships and see what's the outcome. In case Israel gets defeated, at least we are safe on the waters. We can just escape from the enemy. We don't know. She's asking, why did Dan remain in the ships? They heard the call, but they didn't come to battle. They chose to remain in their ships, take care of their own business, maybe enjoy their comfort in their ships, maybe just get ready to escape in the waters. Asher, Asher continued, verse 17, Asher continued at the seashore. So the tribe of Asher, they lived by the Mediterranean coast. And historically at that time, their homes were already kind of in ruins being destroyed by the king of Canaan. So when they heard the call of God, their response was, we will stay and protect ourselves. We don't want to go to battle. That's the tribe of Asher. They chose to stay by the seashore where they had their homes. They didn't respond to the call. But Zebulun and Naphtali, two tribes, they jeopardized their lives. They went into the thick of the battle. And they fought for Israel that day. Amen. So I want to ask you this morning, what kind of a person would you be? Would you be that Reuben type of person? Great resolve. Today you get on, on your knees say, Lord, I'm ready to serve God. And great searchings of the heart. Oh yes, I must serve. I must do something for the house of God. Lord, I'm ready to do everything. But at the end of the day, you still stay with your sheep. The best intention is still in action. Amen. You got to translate your intentions to actions. Or are you going to be like Gilead, preferring to take care of your own profit? Hey, as, as long as I'm fine, as long as I'm living by, by the river Jordan, I'm fine. I'm having my profit, everything's going well. I'll be fine. You guys take care of the house of God. Or are you going to be like Dan? I'll wait and see what happens. I'm fine, comfortable in my ship. In case anything wrong goes wrong, I can take off. Are you going to be like Asher? I'll protect myself. I don't want to risk my own security. I don't want to risk my time. I don't want to risk my energy. I'll protect my own home. Or would you be like the Zebulun and Naphtali, the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, saying, hey, I hear the call of God. I'm willing to get into the battle and fight. Amen. Psalm 110 and verse 3 says, Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. 
God is looking for volunteers in the day of His power. People will say, Lord, I'm serving only for one reason, because I love you. And I want to do this willingly from my heart. Last Sunday, as Pastor Amos finished his message, several of you stood up and made a commitment that you are committed to this house and you're committed to serving God in this place. It was so touching, so moving to see so many. I didn't count, I didn't see everyone, but uh, it was so moving to see so many people come up forward and say, I'm committed to this house and I'm committed to serving here. Amen. This morning we want, to ex we want you to express your commitment. If the ashes can go ahead. Have you already distributed this? Not yet. If you could go ahead and please distribute this volunteer sheet. And a little card for you to take home. To remind you to be a volunteer. Just go ahead and distribute it. You've already given it out? Okay. Let's quickly distribute this volunteer sheet. I want you to take a few moments to indicate where you'd like to serve. There are areas that you could serve. On the back of the sheet, there are, there's a little bit of explanation of what each one involves. And if you just want to say anything, just put a box saying anything and put a tick mark against it. Write your name, phone, mobile, and email. Now, if you don't want to do this today, it's okay. You can take it back home and bring it next Sunday, but don't be like Reuben. You pray over it, think about it. Have great searchings of heart, have great resolve, but then do nothing about it. It's time for some action. So when you take some time just to put your name and contact information, then just take any one area, and then on your way out, you can leave it at the information desk on your right. Sorry, on your way out, the information desk is on your right. You can just leave it there. We will collect these forms this Sunday and the next two Sundays. Put the information together and then give it to our team leaders, the leaders of all the volunteer teams and ministry leaders, so that they can get in touch with you and say, yes, we'd like you to get involved in serving in the house of God and be a volunteer in the house of God. There may be other ideas you have. You're welcome to write it down on the piece of paper that you return, and uh, we can try to incorporate some of them. Uh, depending on the timing and etc. But at least we can have a look at it. Everybody got the sheet? Anybody who didn't get the sheet, please lift your hand up. There are several people up in front here. Anybody else who didn't get the sheet, just lift your hand up. Okay, let's rise up to our feet. We're going to take some time to just pray and respond to the word. You can fill up the form just before you leave and uh, place this form at the information desk on your way out.